Thank you, Cheryl. Good morning, everyone. This is breakout session 2C5, planning for your upcoming accreditation site visit, um, specifically for Violet and Indigo cohorts. In this session, you will be learning the basics of preparing for a site visit. Topics to be reviewed include preconditions, pro program review and common standards, use of data dashboard, the ADS, including performance assessment data, and program completer survey results. In addition to tips for creating a successful interview schedule and accreditation website. As a reminder, this session has been recorded and will be made available in mid-December on the commission's page. It is my pleasure to introduce the presenters for this session. Cheryl Hickey is an administrator in the professional services division at the commission. She has worked in policy and accreditation for the commission since 2002. Cheryl has two college age kids and is counting down the days to her son's anticipated graduation in May so that she has one less tuition payment finally. Cheryl enjoys her job despite the grueling workload because she gets to meet so many people like you throughout the states who are the most dedicated, committed, and innovative educators on the planet and who believe in giving every student and new teacher a chance to reach their full potential. Erin Sullivan is also an administrator in the Commission's Professional Services Division. She works hand in hand with Administrator Cheryl Hickey to implement the Commission's adopted standards and accreditation system. Erin has been at the Commission since 2001, where she worked in the Certification Division and the Office of Governmental Relations before coming to the Professional Services Division. For the last six years, she has been working to rehabilitate 10 acres of land in Grass Valley where she lives with her husband and dogs. One day, they hope to bring goats, ducks, and chicken to the property. <laughs> <laughs> Cheyenne Jones is an analyst in the Commission's Professional Services Division. She assists with collecting program data on the accreditation data system. Cheyenne enjoys crafting, and she has a soft spot for anything chocolate. It is with great pleasure I welcome Administrator Cheryl and Erin and analyst Cheyenne. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, thanks everybody for joining. My video is finally working, which is wonderful. It didn't work on the last session. So we're gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, I'm hoping we have a little bit of time for a couple of questions, but if not, please know that we're always here for you. Um, you can email accreditation at ctc.ca.gov at any point in time uh, during the cycle um, and hopefully answer your specific questions about your institutions. So can you go to the next slide first? All right, most of you know the accreditation cycle. Some of you may be new. Um, and this session is primarily designed for Violet and Indigo because you are kind of gearing up for site visits. But we welcome anybody from any other um, cohorts, of course, um, as you try to learn the system. So um, obviously, this is a seven year accreditation cycle. We won't go into any depth, but those of you who are um, um, getting ready, you're probably, if you are in um, indigo, you are in year five. If you're in violet, you're in year four, and you're both gearing up for year six, which is the accreditation site visit. So um, next slide. We know that this is probably how you feel right now, that there is a scary mountain ahead and you're not sure if you're gonna make it to the top. Um, and we want you all to know that, that we don't want you to feel this way. We are with you every step of the way. We're happy to answer questions. We're happy to work with you on any sticky or thorny issues you may have at your institution to try to figure it out. You go to the next slide, please. This is really how we want it to feel. <laughs> we want you to feel like we're your partners in this journey and that we are taking a stroll through your program to understand it better. Um, obviously, there's going to be some challenges and there's going to be some work. Um, and there are things that, you know, you're going to have to demonstrate that you do. But we really do want you to feel like we're there with you. Um, and, and with that, one of the first things that we do is we try to assign a consultant to work directly with you. So you will get personalized technical assistance in year five. So 
you'll have an initial meeting with your consultant somewhere between a year to nine months in advance. And I know some of you who are thinking, um, wait, I'm in fall of next year and I haven't been assigned your consultant. That is coming very quickly. Um, after that, we really do monthly meetings with you or more frequently if that's what you need and that's what you require and that's what you, you would like to help support you. You can work um, with your CTC consultant directly to figure out how much support you need. Um, we have had visits where we have worked with them, you know, every couple of weeks because they've needed that kind of assistance or like there's been changes in program leadership who really needed to come up to speed. So just know that you at the minimum have an initial meeting with your consultant and then you have monthly or more frequent meetings as you need. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, and the role of this CTC consultant is you know, to make sure your preparations are on track, to make sure that you're, we're not going to be panicking at the last minute, that we really have things in line that the team is going to need to have to have the most successful visit possible. They help you put together or give you input into putting together the interview schedule, which I always say is the most challenging part of the visit, is coming up with this interview schedule, making sure it's something that will work for everything, everybody. Um, providing you with any updates or changes to the process because things do change, as you all know. Um, and in this time of, you know, uncertainty, um, there may be additional things that, you know, may be coming down the pike. We, we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, we want you to know that it's, it is another way to help you stay current. Um, provide you with advice on sticky issues. You know, maybe there is a standard. You know, we're not meeting this standard. What do we need to do to get, you know, up and aligned in time for the site visit? So we, we really say, be honest with your consultant. You know, it, it, it's low stakes at this point in time. They're working with you to help you meet the standards, not to try to, you know, catch you on something. So they will give you their best understanding of what they think that the standard says and means, provide you with some resources, um, get you in touch with people who are experts in this area, uh, those kinds of things. So, and then the, the, the CTC consultant works both with the team lead and the team members as the site visit gets closer um, to make sure that they have what they want. And then while we're having the um, site visit go on, they are making sure there's good communication between the team and the institution as the site visit continues to go on. What is it that the team needs? What are they not seeing from the institution? Making sure the institution has every um, opportunity to provide documents or evidence that's needed. And we ensure the integrity in the process. So if we have perhaps from time to time, we might have a team member who is going beyond the standards or require, you know, wanting the institution to do something different that is not something that is a requirement by the commission. You know, we try to keep them on track, keep them, you know, in line with the standards. Okay, next slide. So you will get your um, consultants assigned. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of this. So for fall 2021 visits, you will get them in that person in the next couple of weeks. We will, we will send you an email letting you know who that person is. We're not a little behind, but I would say fall visits tend to, um, they tend to come a little bit later because we're dealing with so many of the current site visits. And then from spring 2022, um, you will get those very soon. So sometime after January. If you're later in the spring, you'll probably get your assigned consultant later in the spring. And then for fall 2022 visits and spring 23, it's gonna be later on. But this gives you a sense of when you'll have somebody to work with directly and to ask questions um, from, you know, so you have a direct contact to the commission. Okay, next slide. All right, so these are just some key dates for you to um, put in place if you are violet. These are the dates that are in front of you. You've already turned in your preconditions, yay. Um, you've already turned in your program review, and actually Aaron Sullivan is the one who coordinates all of the program reviews that are done. They have been happening, I think we're about midway through the review process at the moment. Um, so thank you for your timely um, submission of those. And then your common standards are what's next. Um, and again, Aaron is the one who coordinates all of that work. That's a lot of work, um, but coordination. And what you'll know is that um, there'll be a subgroup of your actual team site visit that comes from your program review folks and your common standards um, review people. So that the consistency of understanding your programs and your documentation remains uh, throughout the, the site visit. 
The next one indicates your, if you're indigo, so you'll see this is all out by another year, you still have the work to do related to preconditions, program review, and common standards. So, um, you know, we will try to provide you as much technical assistance for each of these as we go through the year. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense of that. And of course, if you're new and you're not in indigo or violet, on the, the Commission's accreditation webpage, there is a program sponsors page, and in that you will see accreditation schedule. So you can find out your exact schedule, or as we said, email us accreditation at ctc.ca.gov. And we can make sure that you understand, you know, what's expected for, the, for your specific accreditation uh, cohort. Okay, next slide. I know I'm going through these quickly, so I just wanna make sure we have a little bit of time. One of the best things we've ever done, although there was a little pushback at the beginning, is that we've required a website. And this has been an enormous help for everybody, actually. So we suggest that you use the same website that you either started for your preconditions or your program review. Um, you know, just build on what you already have now that we've made that a requirement for those, those processes. Um, it really helps facilitate the ease of presenting the information you have to your, to your um, um, site visit team. They know where to find everything. It's a well-organized website, makes reviewers happy and their job easier. It's really, um, it really is been uh, a fantastic way to go with, uh, with um, accreditation. Let's go to the next one. Just some tips for your website as you begin to develop it. Um, we would suggest that you have just easily identifiable tabs. Now, we're not asking for the most beautiful website in the world. You know, simple is fine. Um, have a tab for your preconditions, even though that's a staff review that we'll talk about in a second. Um, having that available for your team, should they need to go back to it, is important. And then have a program tab for each of your programs. Those of you who have, you know, induction only, that will be one tab. But if you offer, you know, let's say you also offer admin induction, um, you know, have a separate tab for that. So, and then within those tabs, that's where you place all of the information. So your original program review submission, your reviewer's feedback, and then the addendum you've created to address the reviewer's feedback. It could all be in one place on, under one tab. Very easy to find, very simple. Same thing with the common standards. So have a common standards tab with the original submission, the reviewer's feedback, and the addendum for addressing the feedback. Um, as Aaron had mentioned at the last session, if you were in the technology assisted, having the interview schedule right there, smack dab on the website, makes it really easy. The reviewers aren't searching for it anywhere. It's right there. Um, and then I would have a separate tab for any items that were added just before or during the visit. So these might be things that the team lead or a team member um, wants some follow-up, you know, as you're having a conversation, you offer, hey, you know, this piece of, piece of information would be really good for you. See, it's not one of the things that we require, but it's something that will help inform you. Those things can be added, and they're a simple tab of some sort that just has a place for things you, you add after the site visit. That way, they, that it's just easy to find. And then optional, any other things you want to highlight. I've seen some really cool like testimonials, videos from participants or from mentor teachers talking about how important the program is. Those are optional, but they're wonderful ways for us to really get to know your program. So that, that's, that's, um, that's sort of this website in a, in a nutshell. You want to go to the next slide? So we often get a question about what about completed candidate work samples? And I threw this in here at the last minute yesterday. I was, I was finalizing this because it came up in my last accreditation site visit. We don't, in any of the documents we require through program review and common standards, ask for completed work. But it is a way for the team members to confirm what they're seeing. So I, I'm talking about things like a completed ILP or IAP for admin. Um, you know, if you have any other documents you require, you know, a couple of samples of that are fine. But I would talk to the team lead before you spend a ton of time, you know, trying to put a lot of candidate work or candidate um, documents online. You know, we're, we really try to keep the ask from the team members to a minimum. So we don't want an institution having to, at the last minute, scramble for a lot of information um, you know, but if it will help inform the team, they're just not seeing 
how, you know, they see the form, the ILP form, but they're just curious, how is it being done? They want to know that it is being done. You know, a few samples is a good idea. Um, and again, it's a little tricky, so make sure that this is something you talk with your team lead about. Okay, next slide. This is a, um, a sample induction website, and I, I apologize, this is a couple of years old, so there's going to be some um, older documents on here. But if you wanted to go through it, I don't want to go through it right now, but it's very, um, it's, it's, it's very easy. You can see the, what we were talking about in terms of the setup and the simplicity of making sure that it's just easy to navigate. I think that's the main thing. And you might want to talk to your red cohort friends, people who are going through it right now. There are tons of good examples of websites right now. Um, I just simply did not have enough time to kind of gather a few for you today. Um, but we, we are happy to kind of pull those together in the next um, couple of weeks so that those of you in Violet and Indigo will have some sources to go through. So I will commit to doing that. And we will make sure that you know about that um, through either the PSDE news or some other um, way to know that. But really excellent job that, that institutions are doing with their websites, making it very clear. Okay, next one, I think I'm gonna to toss it over to Erin. And if I can, just on that note about the websites, I've also been working on trying to create a really basic, just sort of visual template, just in Word. So I'm not creating a website, but something that we can offer programs moving forward, because for instance, Cheryl talked about tabs. So sometimes that's how they're organized, tabs across the top. Um, I've also seen it organized with like, um, um, like a table of contents bar almost on the left. So it's links, um, you know, preconditions and then program review in each of the programs and then common standards review. So um, hopefully we can get just some resources between good examples of websites that, that were easy for us to use and then maybe also just sort of a basic formatting template will we'll, um, make that available. Most of you, however, and this will kind of lead me into the next few slides, most of you have already embarked on your, on your accreditation site visit website um, because you've started uh, by posting your preconditions because we are asking a precondition submissions come in that way now, as well as program review and common standards review. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit just um, about the accreditation sort of cycle, that, that nice little graphic you saw at the beginning on our earlier slide and what's involved in each of those. And again, because um, the Violet and Indigo folks uh, are already, have already sort of started on this, I will go through it a little quickly. So if you're from an institution or a color cohort that's several years out, this might feel a little fast for you, but we, we always have, we have lots of resources for you um, and lots of technical assistance from consultants that can help you with any questions you have. So in this new seven year cycle, new, I still say new because we, we haven't gotten all of our color cohorts through it yet. So it's still new for some folks. Preconditions are due in years one and four. Um, preconditions responses now include general preconditions, which are at more of a um, sort of the institutional infrastructure level, um, the unit, if you will. And then preconditions submissions are also due um, in from each of the programs. So we have a set of program specific preconditions for teacher induction or for, as Cheryl said, maybe clear admin induction, or maybe you've got an intern program. Um, so we have program specific preconditions that are due for, for all of those. Um, those are due again in years one and four. These are really important. Um, we have specific evidence that's required for them. We have created guidance documents for each of the preconditions. So if you go to the preconditions page on the commission's website, you can access those guidance documents that will help you prepare your precondition submissions. Um, but because preconditions are grounded in um, education code or regulations or commission adopted policies, you have to be, your, your programs and your institution has to be in alignment with the preconditions at all times. So once the review of your precondition submission is completed, if there's any issues, you have to address that immediately. Um, and we'll, we'll do that back and forth until you're in alignment because you, you, you must be. So for Violet, um, as well as the green cohort. Um, Violet last year uh, submitted in um, March, in, I'm sorry, spring of 2020, 
submitted their preconditions responses. Um, that was year four for Violet. Green did as well. The green cohort is in year one. Um, in 2021, so this coming up spring, preconditions responses are due from the Indigo cohort institutions by March 31st, as well as the yellow cohort institutions who will be in their um, year one in, in this coming year. Uh, the staff, the, I'm sorry, as Cheryl mentioned earlier, preconditions are reviewed by staff. So these are not a peer review process. They come in and staff um, consultants and some administrators review all of the precondition submissions, um, gets back to you with any feedback or concerns or additional information that's needed, uh, and you will be addressing those concerns um, ASAP. Then those submissions will be shared on your accreditation website as well. Um, we do not ask the teams to dive in to your preconditions sub, um, submissions or your preconditions responses, um, but occasionally something will occur during the site visit um, that may rise to the level of a precondition. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully we've addressed all of those things in advance, but if anything arises during your site visit that, um, that, that rises to the, to the level of a precondition, that's going to be taken very seriously by the COA, again, because those um, preconditions are grounded in statute and regulations and, and commission adopted policies. So um, your team would definitely be communicating with you about that at the time of your site visit as with anything else. All right, so preconditions are years one and four. In year five, you have program review. So for Violet Cohort, you, you uh, submitted your Program review submissions this last October for Indigo cohort, you'll be submitting next October. Um, those submissions are due on October 15th. These are not reviewed by staff. So pro, uh, program review submissions are reviewed by um, a pair or sometimes a trio um, of, of reviewers. They will look through all of the required evidence that has been requested. Um, we have evidence submissions guides on our program review webpage. So you um, have very clear um, information and guidelines around what needs to be submitted. It's very, very evidence heavy. Um, if any of you did a program assessment many years ago, you will remember how much that um, relied on narrative, hundreds, sometimes thousands of pages of narrative that was not only um, put together by you, but then had to be reviewed by, um, by reviewers. We have moved away from that. Um, it is, there's very little narrative. You will see where it's requested in the program review submission guidelines manuals on our website. Everything else is um, really authentic pieces of evidence that you've already created within your program. Things like um, professional development um, descriptions, things like mentor handbooks, um, things like handbooks for your candidates, Things that you already have, those are the kinds of pieces of evidence that we are requesting now. Um, the results from program review will be returned to you. You will have an opportunity to create addendum responses to those. Um, and that information will be made available to the site visit team 60 days prior to the site visit. So whenever you get your feedback back from program review, you have some time to get your addenda um, created, you will have a consultant, hopefully, who will be able to, well, you will have a consultant, um, and your consultant will be able to help you kind of work through um, maybe your agenda response, how to get that posted, what, what might be um, some good evidence um, to help address any concerns that the program reviewers had. And then the site visit team will be able to use both the feedback from program review and the agenda that you create um, to, to help focus um, their um, interview questions for the site visit um, and some of the writing that they'll be doing. And then in order to also create some really nice continuity between um, program review and your site visit, a subset of the individuals who review your program review submissions will also be on your site visit. So if a pair of reviewers reviewed your um, teacher induction um, program review submission, one of those two reviewers will then be asked to be on your site visit. And that provides a really nice 
um, level of continuity, um, which we have found to be very valuable um, on the site visits. All right, also in year five, but in the spring of year five, common standard submissions are due. So at the end of February, you'll be submitting um, responses to common standards. And we also have a common standards submission guide um, that's on our website. It's on the, on the common standards review webpage. As with program review, there is specific elements of evidence that are required, and we outline those for you. It's very limited on narrative, again, very focused on evidence. Um, that hopefully that is meant to be a little easier for you. We're asking for evidence pieces, again, that you are already creating for the successful operation of your program. Um, so hopefully those things will make sense and there'll be things that you already have. Um, some things may be new for you to put together, for instance, a list of your faculty and who they're assigned to, um, mentors, um, who they're assigned to, uh, and then those are some things that you can just be updating as you go um, through the years so that when you come around again in year five of the following accreditation cycle for yourself, you're updating rather than creating things new. The Common Standards Review submissions are reviewed by the team lead and the Common Standards team members that have been or will be assigned to your site visit. So again, we, there's a really nice level of continuity there. Those individuals will review. You will get that um, feedback back. Any requests for additional clarification of, or evidence will be there on the feedback. And um, like with program review, you will create uh, responses to that feedback, um, create an addendum for your accreditation webpage and have that posted um, along with everything else 60 days prior to your site visit. Then year six, year six is when your site visit will be held. We are doing site visits um, on, a, on a much more sort of year round basis now. So we have site visits in the fall as well as in the spring. Um, if you are a Violet cohort, your site visit has, um, your site visit dates have already been selected and identified. For Indigo cohort folks, the um, request to set those site visit dates will be coming out in the spring. So. Um, definitely be looking for that. We send that information to your to your program leads, your directors, um, whoever you've identified as as um, those contact people in the accreditation data system. So in year six, we send a site visit team. Well, send <laughs> if we're doing it virtually, um, but uh, hopefully we'll be back to in person at some point. So we send a site visit team to be present. Those individuals will come having reviewed feedback from program review and common standards review, as well as having reviewed your addenda responses to that feedback. Um, and they will be coming to your institution to conduct interviews that will um, basically triangulate what they have seen in program review and common standards review. Um, it is not meant to be an aha, they are not coming to you know, open all your closets and search for your skeletons. They are coming to verify um, all of the positive things that they see in the evidence that you've submitted in program review and common standards review, and to ask clarifying questions for any areas, maybe where there was some feedback or some areas of concern. Um, it, they will um, take into consideration also information from the accreditation data system and the data dashboards that are now available for all of the institutions. That includes information that is input by you through the ADS, but also um, survey information. Um, those are your completer surveys, your mentor teacher surveys, employer surveys, as well as other data that is gathered and input by you into the ADS. And then of course those interviews um, become that sort of very final piece uh, during the site visit. As we said, the site visit team will be comprised of a subset of program reviewers, as well as those individuals who review your common standards um, and will be covering the common standards review during the site visit, including a team lead. And then based on the um, feedback from the team and the accreditation uh, recommendation that they make to the COA, the COA will make a, a, a final decision on your accreditation status which could be full accreditation 
or it could be accreditation with um, any number of sort of level of stipulations and the um, COA can then make a decision if there are stipulations, what kind of follow-up they may like to have. Site visit teams like your consultants will be um, assigned to your site visit uh, in advance of the site visit, but we will not um, indicate or release to you, I guess, the names of your site visit team um, until we get closer to the site visit. Um, we just like to protect the confidentiality of the team as it does its work moving forward. And also things can happen. Sometimes um, somebody has something that bubbles up in their life um, for better or for worse, and they can't be on the site visit and we need to you know, replace that person. It rarely happens at the last minute, um, but for, for that and any number of reasons, you will know who your site visit team is before they get to your, to your site visit. Um, but probably not till maybe about 60 days out from your site visit. Your consultant, as Cheryl mentioned, will be assigned nine to 12 months in advance. So you will have an opportunity to start meeting with that person on a monthly basis leading up to your site visit or more often um, if that's what you need or, and that's what you and your consultant decide that you need to do. Um, as I've mentioned several times, you do have to have your accreditation webpage available 60 days in advance of your site visit. Um, that gives your team a good amount of time to get in there, start reading, start reading your agenda, maybe ask additional clarifying questions even before that site visit, get those to you so you can just continue to refine and uh, to refine your evidence and clarify your evidence so that you can have a, a, as successful a site visit as possible. Um, your site visit team will always have a team lead, um, your consultant, of course. You'll have one or two common standards team members, really depending on the number of programs that you have. Um, if you have, for instance, a single induction program, you'll probably have one team lead, one common standards reviewer, and then one program reviewer. Um, if you have um, many programs, maybe you have six programs, maybe you're offering some added authorization programs, or you've got an intern program, um, you will have likely more than one common standards reviewer and possibly some additional program reviewers, but you will know the size of your team prior to your site visit. So at the site visit, the team will um, again conduct interviews, um, finish reviewing any evidence that you've submitted in advance, ask for clarifying evidence possibly at your site visit, and then they will make decisions uh, on your institution's alignment to both the common standards and also to all applicable program standards for all of the programs that you offer. Um, standards decisions are met, met with concerns or not met. And based on those decisions um, on the standards, the team then makes an accreditation recommendation for your accreditation status to the COA. Um, the COA, uh, and if there is, um, if there are any stipulations necessary, so if, if your um, accreditation recommendation to the COA is accreditation with stipulations or major stipulations or probationary stipulations, the team also crafts those stipulations and presents those along with the, its accreditation recommendation to the COA. Now, the COA cannot change the team's findings on standards, so the met, met with concerns or not met stands, but the COA does have the ability to um, either accept or modify the team's recommendation for your accreditation status. So the COA can accept accreditation or accreditation with stipulations, or it could modify and say, you know, based on what we're reading, we really feel like this needs to be um, major stipulations or probationary stipulations. The um, COA can also modify the stipulations themselves um, to add to them if they feel that that's necessary. So that could happen um, at the COA meeting at the time that you're there. So I'm gonna move into talking a little bit about getting your site visit schedule ready. Your site visit schedule is, is very important, obviously, to the team. You need to be sure that the team has the opportunity to um, interview all of the uh, stakeholders that are involved in the operations of your program, as well as your candidates and completers who are moving through your program. Um, when you build your site visit schedule, you're either going to use a table in Word 
or perhaps um, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and I know this is difficult. I don't have a visual example of this, but um, I think that this should make sense. You're going to have basically a grid and across the top, you're gonna to list all of your team members. So you're gonna have a column for the team lead. You're gonna have a column for your common standards reviewer or reviewers, so maybe more than one column. You're gonna, and then you're gonna have a column for each of your program reviewers. Then in the main, um, oh, I'm sorry, actually, let me not jump ahead too far. So you'll have a common for each, column for each of your reviewers. You'll have a column um, probably at the very beginning for the time slots that you're gonna have during the day. And then throughout the grid of the document, you will list each of the constituents that those individuals are gonna interview um, and, uh, and the times that, the, that they will have interview sessions. Consultants do not generally participate in, um, in, I'm sorry, in interview sessions, so they're not going to have their own column, but they are absolutely available if needed to either pinch hit for one of the uh, site visit team members or um, to join in if, for instance, it's a particularly large group of constituents and maybe the, the reviewer needs a little bit of assistance. Um, or as you have to maybe add interviews during the, during the site visit, maybe you find that you didn't get enough folks to show up for, for your completer interview or for your in, uh, employer interview, and you need to add another interview. If that interview time doesn't work for maybe the program reviewer, the common standards reviewer, um, your site visit consultant can step in perhaps and take that interview session on for those folks. Cheryl, you're muted. Did you want to add something? Um, I just was checking the time, so we have probably about 10, 11 minutes. So you may have oh, goodness. To... Yes, I know. It goes fast, Sorry. doesn't it? <laughs> I'll go faster. Um, other things to consider about building your site visit schedule. The first day is a really good time for you to have some kind of an overall orientation. Um, include the leadership within your program and the entire team for maybe a one-hour session where you kind of introduce them to who you are, what's unique about you, and what you're doing. Some of that information is in your program summary as well, but it's a nice way to kick off the interview session. Um, we can have now interviews for your program directors uh, in advance of the site visit. We have found that that can also be really, really useful. So maybe a couple of weeks in advance of your site visit, have some individual interviews for the program reviewers and those folks that, they're that, that lead the programs that they're assigned to interview. Um, that can also help for your program directors to offer some clarification to program reviewers before they get to the site visit. It can be really, really helpful. Um, make sure that your site visit schedule includes some open sessions during the day. It's really important for reviewers to have some time to debrief, to decompress, to make some notes, to talk with each other. So include some open times for your program reviewers as well, by the way, as there needs to be 10 or 15 minutes at least in between each interview session, even on Zoom, or maybe more especially on Zoom, people need some time to stand up and stretch and use the bathroom and get a drink of water. And then of course, you'll build in time for your mid-visit report, um, usually the second day of your site visit. Um, if it's a Sunday through Wednesday site visit, we usually do the mid-visit report on Tuesday morning. Um, if it's a Monday, through Wednesday, maybe that's Tuesday afternoon, um, maybe it's Monday night, um, but definitely build in some time for that as well as some time for um, you as the leaders of your program to check in um, sort of at the end of the day or maybe midday with the team lead uh, and the state consultant. Uh, I don't wanna breeze through this too quickly, so maybe I'll just use real blunt language. Getting sufficient numbers of folks to your interview sessions is critical. Uh, if we do not get a sufficient number of, for instance, completers or candidates, the team can actually say that it did not see enough people to make a decision on, on, a, uh, um, on a set of program standards. So it's really, really critical. And we are seeing that candidates and completers are having an especially hard time getting to these interviews. It's either COVID exhaustion, um, anxiety, Zoom exhaustion, but schedule these interview sessions as early as you can. If you don't have an exact time, maybe just tell folks, our site visit is this date through this date. Please hold these dates on your calendar, especially the people in your program. But candidates and completers, as soon as you can, get those scheduled, confirm with people 
remind them and confirm again. We had a program director at our previous session say she thought maybe she was being a little overly pesky with her folks. Um, and I was shaking my head in the background. You can't be overly pesky. This site visit is high stakes for you. Um, so you do whatever you need to do to make sure folks understand and that they're gonna be there for those site visits. I'm sorry, for those interview sessions. I'm gonna turn this over now to Cheyenne. Um, Cheyenne is our ADS um, guru and she's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, the, oh no, I'm sorry, this is annual surveys. I saw annual and I immediately thought ADS. This is Cheryl. Cheryl's gonna talk to you a little bit about these annual surveys. Yeah, let me do this very quickly because I think the annual data system is more important. Obviously, you know that um, we do annual surveys of program completers. Um, that's done at the time that they get their credential. Um, we are trying to use that data to help inform site visits. So asking candidates about both the TPEs at the preliminary level and the CSTPs at the, at the, um, at the clear level, you know, finding out how supportive the program is. So we are um, continuing to do that. Um, if we have a very, very high response rate for your program, it means that we can probably reduce the number of interviews of completers. We know completers are the hardest people to get. Now, the Committee on Accreditation is having a little um, problem with that. They're, they're struggling with trying to figure out the sweet spot and number of interviews for completers. But just know that, you know, if your numbers are high, it helps us make, it informs the accreditation decisions. Um, go to the next slide. I'm going to try to do this quick. Um, we do do these, uh, I will let you see this. So we have program completers. We also do the master teachers and we do employers um, surveys. Um, so we do all of that and hopefully um, allow the team to see the information and that they use that information from these completer surveys to um, come up with some questions for you. So if you have a number of completers who say that they have um, did not feel well prepared in a certain area. That will become, you know, part of the questioning or the inquiry as we try to figure out, is it the program? Is it the environment? What is it exactly? Does it matter? Does it fit into the, to the program standards um, questions? So um, let me just jump to the annual data systems submission. Go ahead, Cheyenne. The annual data submission um, helps answer questions about the educator preparation in California. It is updated annually and submitted electronically each year. CTC staff and site visit team members will have access to the data that is submitted. And ADS data was piloted on the accreditation dashboard in the 2019 and 20 year. Annual data includes information about programs, variety of pathways. Induction might not have as much pathways as other programs, but this year we did add the eco pathway and the general education and the special education pathways. Also the number of units and delivery models, program requirements, field work hours, and demographic data such as enrollment numbers and candidate demographics. And data types will expand over time to include performance assessment, other outcome data. Um, the ADS was built in the 2016-2017 year. Data submission began for all institutions in the fall of 2018. And the initial data analysis also began in the fall of 2018. The full implementation was in the 2018-19 year. And enhancements are being integrated every year on the ADS. Okay, senior data, dash data dashboard, that is a new process this year. So you'll be able to see your institution's dashboard by logging on the ADS system. So if you're a user, you're just using your regular username and password to get into the system. And the dashboard will be there. Um, the data will be shared with the accreditation team. And questions about the data system, you could go and attend the office hours or you could email me and I'll be able to assist you on the dashboard. That is the link to our ADS website. And again, the office hours will be available. They are usually during the submission timeframe. I believe they'll start maybe mid-February or early March of 2021. And we will email the Zoom links every week on the PSDE news. And also it's on their annual data, data submission um, CTC page. The office hours will be there. Okay, 
Okay, great. Um, so we know that you, I, we only have a couple minutes left, but we know you all are wondering how does all this COVID flexibility impact accredita accreditation? And because things are so fluid, we're just saying stay alert, stay flexible. Um, we obviously know that um, induction is bearing a lot of the burden of the COVID flexibilities. Um, so we um, are trying to, at each commission meeting, the commission is discussing sort of their expectations for how this all is going to play out over the next, you know, couple of years. So just be alert and listen. I would, I would look at the commission's website and their meeting schedule every single time they meet to see if there's something related to COVID. I would talk to your consultant. I would read the PSD e-news. We will try to be as you know, communicative as we can about that. So keep track of it, understand your candidates, understand what requirements they need. Um, it's gonna be a real um, wide ranging group. Um, you know, we're having discussions right now about the candidates who are, who are in programs right now, preliminary programs right now, who may be coming out with no classroom experience by the end of the year, if that's what COVID is heading towards. So we're having that discussion with the commission at the moment. Um, and so we don't have a crystal ball. So we just ask you all to stay alert and stay up on what the commission is requiring. And we will try to be um, as clear as we can as to how it impacts your accreditation system. Um, okay, next slide. And all right. Um, the seventh year, we just, we didn't want to forget the seventh year. If there are stipulations, um, the institution gets a year to fix the stipulations. Um, so the Committee on Accreditation could require reports and or a re revisit. Um, it could require more frequent site visits if it's probationary or real, a lot of issues. Um, but generally, you know, there, generally there are some issues that are found, but not, um, it's, it's, it's less frequent if you, if for, um, you know, the more serious kinds of accreditation findings as probationary. Um, and, uh, <laughs> ignore the last, ignore the last bullet that was, um, left over from last year and I didn't catch it. We are working on the issue of program exemplars. Um, so this year in the middle of a crisis, we're not going to worry about program exemplars. Next slide. Okay. I don't know if we have any time for, okay. We have three minutes <laughs> for questions. I know that one of the questions, um, Aaron, that was asked was about the expectation for Violet cohorts and when they can expect their program review feedback. Do you want to talk? I don't know what the next sessions are, so maybe you can be very specific. Sure. So we are, um, I, I have a program review session tomorrow. That's actually section eight, session eight of 14. Um, the review is reviewed by staff after it comes back so that we make sure it makes sense and we can follow it with the teams if it doesn't. Um, but, you know, you can probably expect to get that feedback back in February. I know some institutions have said we want to get it back before common standards review. It should not affect your responses to common standards review because we're asking for some very specific evidence there as well. So, um, you know, you will get it back. The last session I have is on January 20th, and we are holding the feedback till we get all of it. Because if we start to send it out program by program, then individuals start emailing, like, my, my co colleague got theirs, but I didn't get mine. So once we have finished that last program review session on January 20th, we will finalize that feedback and start sending it back to you. So m my hope is February, knock on wood, that no other major work comes in the middle of that, but that's my hope. Oh, you're muted. I think you were unmuted and then muted yourself. There we go. Sorry about that. I think okay. um, that was one of the biggest questions. Let's see. It says, um, there's one question. Are the commission adopted standards on the screen right now the same as the common standards that you've been referring to? Okay, so there are, there are common standards and there are program standards. So both of the current sets of standards are on the um, Standards page. That web page. To, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so if you go to that commission adopted standards page there, you'll have access to the preconditions, you'll have access to common standards, you'll have access to program standards. So you just click on those links and sort of click through. <clears throat> but that's the place to start for sure. Exactly. Um, and I also think that, on, the, on the ADS, I just wanted to say something on the ADS. So we did mention that teams will have access to your accreditation data dashboard 
for your site visit. Um, we give the teams access for a limited period of time. So just so you know, because you're logging in through your ADS, we're gonna give them a unique login so that they can um, see that information on your data dashboard for the site visit. And then that login actually will expire when your site visit ends. So they'll be able to get in and see it. But then after that, it, you know, I mean, it's somewhat confidential information, right? It's specific to your program. So I just wanted to reassure you. They see hey, Yuri, it, do you want to put, do you want to put it on the last slide, which is the accreditation um, email? Yes. Thank you. Oh, next one. There you go. And this is, I know we, we, this was a lot of information in an hour. So um, accreditation at ctc.ca.gov for any other questions, please. Thank you everybody who is participating. I think, I really thank you. Um, you will have a, a successful visit. I'm sure of it. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Cheryl, Erin, and Cheyenne for the informative presentation. Thanks to everyone for attending. Please note that the presentation material is available on Google Drive and the link is provided on the agenda. Up next, we're scheduled for a lunch break from noon to 12.45. And the next session, breakout session three, is scheduled for 12.50. If you need a new Zoom link to access the new session and you will find the link on the agenda. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.